This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Marston Parker. Marston is a market wizard. He was featured in Jack Schwager's Unknown Market Wizards. Even though I had Jack on this podcast to discuss that book, I did not recall Marston's name. If somebody wants to beat me over the head for that, feel free. This podcast has got more than a few episodes. However, I am connected to the world and my friend, Raphael Wilhelm, out of Switzerland, said, hey, you need to interview Marston. Raphael connected us, and today you get to listen to my conversation with Marston Parker. I hope you enjoy this wide-ranging conversation all about system testing and the system mindset. My first thought, maybe, it will be considered controversial. But I started to think back to the 90s. I used to see these events that were held. Usually it was the Futures Industry Association. And they would have these events in Chicago. And I have some cassette tapes from these events with some great traders on these cassette tapes. The premise was pitting discretionary traders versus systematic traders. Back in the day, I was like, how do I know? I don't know anything, right? I'm just listening to all these smart folks. As time has gone on, and I've had a chance to meet a lot of people and hear a lot of stories, I think back to people like Sakota, who may have been doing punch cards in the late 60s, worst case, early 70s, Bill Dreis right there with him, Bill Dunn right there with him, Richard Dennis right there with him, all four of those men using computing technology in the 70s, for sure, to manage their trading, to systematize their trading. So I'm curious from your perspective, what do you think about this debate? I don't know that it's really a debate in my humble opinion. I start to also wonder when I think back over time, how do you know if someone's discretionary or not? Is it marketing? The systematic guys like you come out and you say, this is what I do. I'm systematic. Bill Dunn, I'm systematic. Paul Mulvaney, systematic. But if someone says they're discretionary, it's kind of like the magic elixir. I used to remember these CTA disclosure documents that would come out, there would always be something unusual about some of the trend following ones that would strike me because it would be like, well, we're 95% systematic and 5% discretionary. And then I would look at all the performance track records and I'm like, where is all this discretionary stuff? What is your thought about this? Because obviously you've been featured in a book where this was part of the debate, part of the conversation. I'm just going to lay it out. And I think there's a lot more systematic trading going on over the decades than people have known or led on to. That's my stance on that. What's your feeling? Yeah, I would agree with that. Bottom line is I really have no idea. I mean, we know so little about what people are really doing or how many people are there. I mean, I know that when Jack set out to write this latest book, he had trouble finding people wanting to be in it. The guy who recommended me for the book recommended a couple of other people who had much better track records than mine who just didn't want to become known. They prefer their current unknown status. In my experience, I mean, I've talked to a a bunch of people who've been successful with discretionary trading. I don't think very many people are, let's say, purely intuitive. I mean, there's usually some kind of method under it. At least all the good ones I've ever talked to say they have a method. Sometimes the method they say they have, I'm not sure that's really the source of their edge, even if they believe it is. And I think that's all okay. You need something that gives you confidence to show up every day and put it on trades, no matter how you're trading. I typically find when I try to take the method a discretionary trader says they're using and turn it into a completely mechanical algorithm, usually doesn't have a positive expectancy. That's an interesting fact. The way I think of it is a discretionary trader's method gives them the framework they need to show up and let their intuition kick in. I'm sure that it's possible to develop intuition for like situational awareness of what's going on in the market. Oh, I've seen this kind of thing before. I know this happens. Something like that. That kind of approach didn't work for me when I 
Right. It, I would see it as a spectrum as well. The other thing you, you pointed out about how even people who claim they're systematic, but if they say, but we introduce discretion 1% of the time or 0.1% of the time, I mean, even then you would have to drill down and say, well, how much effect did that have on your results? I have discretion in my trading in that the individual trade selection is there's zero discretion. It's a strategy selection or strategy tweaking, let's say, has discretion. So in other words, I don't have a meta system where my selection of systems is also mechanical. At some point, there has to be a discretionary layer that you get to. It's a spectrum. If I look back over the last, let's say, 50 years, going back to the early 70s, late 60s, why would any trader in their right mind, assuming we're trying to be logical and rational, given these tools, the ability to code, backtest, why would any trader not take advantage of those tools? What becomes the risk to not take advantage of those tools in terms of your client base, if that's what one does? Because ultimately, using these tools seems pragmatic. Using these tools seems like first thing you have to do. To me, I'm right there knee deep into the discretionary systematic debate. I'm not really sure it's a debate. Take, for example, Jim Simons, someone that you have an interesting little connection to in your career. I don't think Jim Simons is sitting around with a bunch of riverboat gamblers honing their intuition. I mean, those guys are for sure systematic. Right. I totally agree with your premise, especially if you're managing other people's money. And even if you're just managing your own and reporting to your spouse or just reporting to yourself, of course, there's never real predictability of what your results are going to be in the future, no matter what. The more stable it all seems, knowing that you have a repeatable process, I don't see how anyone does it without that. There's a certain allure to... That's the word, though, allure. Allure, yeah, exactly. That's where I'm going. That's why the trend-following traders, some of them used to say, oh, we've got a small percentage of discretion because I guess the investors want to believe there's a magic secret sauce of intuition or whatnot. Whereas I think there's enough evidence over the last 20 or 30 years, that's just not the case. For example, if I stated, we'll talk many different strategies today, but if I stated trend-following, it sure seems like most people are systematic. Right. It's clear in the latest book of Jack's that the discretionary traders, well, I guess they're pretty much all discretionary other than me, have better stats. And I think he even maybe makes the claim that overall the people he's interviewed, that on average, the discretionary people have somewhat better stats. But I think there's a degree of selection bias there. My premise here, we don't necessarily know when someone says they're discretionary, what that means exactly, or if it's even true. Exactly. It comes back to the fact that it's really a spectrum. This has just been one of my little things that I've thought over the years, because again, you can never really know if you're looking at the playing field of potential traders out there, professional traders that report their track records. I just go back to like first principles. I remember back in the 90s saying, well, this is really interesting. All these traders, and I'm speaking of trend following traders, are doing something similar because I could see in their performance they were winning and losing in the same months, often unaffiliated with each other. And this was just terribly interesting information to me. Yeah. For whatever reason, we seem to have more historical data on the CTAs, the future CTAs in particular, and what their stats are. And it's easier for the average person to find that stuff online and compare them and look at them and so on. People who were running discretionary stock hedge funds, I don't know if there's even as much data out there about what the results have been. And if there is data, what can you do with it unless somebody tells you the story that went along with the data? I can't recall off the top of my head, but there were certain instances where I found CTAs back in the day where they would be described as discretionary. And then I start to contrast their performance against, let's say, some systematic trend guys. I'm like, oh, eh, I'm not sure about this discretionary label. <laughs> Maybe this is marketing. That's what I'm ultimately getting at sometimes. I mean, I'm sure there's some guys that sit down at the cockpit, so to speak. They've figured something out. I guess then it also becomes another part this kind of leads into is what's the lifestyle? What's the quality of life? What does one want? You must love, from a quality life standpoint, what you do being a systematic guy. You must love a quality of life standpoint. This is a totally different topic we may revisit or not. From a financial management long-term point of view, I made an interesting decision to quit my job and try to support my family through trading. Early on in that process, I was kind of dabbling in this and that, finding my way. And 
I didn't know from the very beginning that I was going to be systematical. I probably leaned that way. I mean, this was 1998 or so. So I dabbled in discretionary day trading for a while, maybe for a month, doing that thing where you're actually watching the market all day, every day. And I don't even think I lasted a month. To your point, it was very clear to me that I didn't want that. What's the point of quitting your job to stare at the screen all day? And you had the coding background. You had the coding background. For me, coding is fun. It's my flow experience. That's what I want to be doing. Watching price ticks and trying to decide which direction they're going next is not even slightly fun. Except, getting back to this word allure, there's the gambling thing. Just like in a casino, if you just put on a good size trade in ES futures at random and it happens to go your way, you're like, oh, I can do this. I'm going to do this again. You get rewarded just often enough to keep you coming at it. I had to go through that and convince myself that with a large enough sample size, I was going to lose money doing that thing. When did you do your first back tests? Name the strategy. Was it on a commercial piece of software? Was it something you designed? I first developed an interest in the market in 1996 when my company went public and I was watching our own stock every day. And then knowing I, for the first time in my life, had an investment problem that I had to solve. I was looking for a method from the start. The first books I read talked about fundamental methods like rank stocks based on PE versus growth or something like that. But it became clear to me that I couldn't test that. I had feeling from the start, I didn't want to just start doing something unless I could test it myself somehow or see some kind of stats of how it would have done in the past. When was your first test? The first one, I think it was probably 1996. There was a off-the-shelf product called Window on Wall Street. I think I bought it in Staples, connected it to my modem and I think the data came from some company called Dial Data. You could only test on one symbol at a time. And I was learning what technical analysis was and what all the standard indicators were and all that usual stuff. And I remember going through them one by one and testing them on a stock or a few different stocks. The only thing I found that didn't lose money when I was trying that was buy when RSI crosses above 30 and sell when it crosses below 70 or something like that. It whet my appetite for that kind of approach. The first really successful method I used, it was systematic, but it was manually implemented, semi-systematic, semi-discretionary, really. We had a rule to scan for stocks that were breaking out with unusual volume out of consolidation, looked at those charts and said, okay, which one looks the cleanest and the best? And so, okay, we'll take positions in those. And then the exits were completely mechanical. After several months of trading that way and doing well with it, I started being curious to be able to test it further. Like, can we make the entry selection mechanical? Well, first of all, let's test different exits, different exit rules and see how they would have done with the trades we actually made. Then let's see if we can make the entries mechanical. And by the end of that, end of two years, I would say, yeah, I finally was fully mechanical forever at the start of 2000. 1999, I went back and forth and I actually had a fairly mediocre year in 1999, which is a little unusual for a stock trader. Let me keep it at that time period, 96 to 99, your kind of formative stage. Here you are, you're testing assorted technical analysis, precepts, indicators, whatever one wants to call them. Some of these, I guess, some of the classic pattern stuff, I'm guessing you probably went through everything, just trying to be comprehensive. Did you know at the time, though, as I go back to, it's not a sales pitch for my world, did you know at the time when here you are investigating systematic methods, using coding. Did you know about this CTA industry at that time? Yeah, weirdly, I didn't, which was really weird because, as you mentioned, the last company I worked for, the chairman was Jim Simons. He had a venture capital fund in the early 90s, and we happened to be one of the companies they invested in. I didn't really know anything about him. He wasn't as well known in the trading world in the early 90s as he is now. I just knew that he was a commodity trader. I didn't know what that was exactly. And that he had made a lot of money at it. I was kind of slow to learn all this stuff. At some point, I started using TradeStation with CSI data, and I saw that they had both futures and stocks. The futures confused me. I just didn't get the whole thing about point value and multiples. And for whatever reason, I stuck with stocks and didn't go down that route. I remember passing the Series 3, and I remember for somebody who had never been exposed to that world, I was like, oh, man. I mean, I passed it. It was still one of those things. If you don't grow up in the Chicago area, so to speak, if you don't grow up on Wall Street with friends and associates connected, 
you're right, futures trading is a touch different to say the least. If you watch CNBC, I was watching that, or before that, that thing on PBS, Nightly Business Report, I think it was called. Those kind of shows, and there wasn't much available back then. I mean, now there's 10,000 different things to watch on the internet. It's a whole different world. The main message you hear is, oh, futures are risky because they have leverage. I think I probably had that bias for quite a while. It's really silly. Once you actually understand what's going on and you realize you're risking a certain amount of money on each trade, it doesn't matter what the underlying leverage of the product happens to be. Exactly. To take it back to Jim Simons for a second, I spoke to Greg Zuckerman, who wrote the bio book on him in the last couple of years. Yeah, great book. I heard that interview. The interesting thing in that book was that he had been inspired by Richard Dennis, which was really fascinating. Look, I would assume a guy like, you're welcome to comment on this too. Apparently, no one knows anything about Jim Simons, but I would assume, again, as I said earlier in this conversation, a systematic guy. And I would assume he probably has systematic strategies ranging from the trend following to the mean reversion, probably across every time frame we could imagine. Who knows what they're doing? From what I've gleaned, uh, they're not so much in the longer term time frames like the classic trend followers are using. Probably everything from intraday minutes up to holding for a few weeks. Who knows? And then there's a difference between what they do in Medallion, which is the most secret, versus public hedge funds. Of course, as has been written, a lot of his skill is as a manager in terms of being able to convince some really smart people to work together and do clever things that work. When you first got rolling, did it take you any time to wrap your arms around the idea that you were going to be long and short? Oh, I kind of knew that from the beginning. When I first got started in 1996, we were already in a pretty substantial bull market. I mean, 95 was a straight up year in the stock market. Greenspan was using this irrational exuberance phrase everywhere. When I met with a financial planner to try to decide how to invest IPO money, and he showed me the usual very long-term chart that stocks always go up 10% a year, so I just put it, whatever, 70, 30, 60, 40 portfolio, blah, blah, blah. I felt like, yeah, there must be a big crash coming soon. I've always had this feeling like there's probably a big crash coming soon. You did not immediately just accept stocks always go up? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for one thing, just look at the charts. At first, I probably was thinking long only. The first mentor that I found online, Gary B. Smith, he was trading long short. That woke me up to the short side. And as soon as I saw that, I embraced that idea of always trading both sides which is really the main source of my outperformance, such as it is, is the fact that I've traded the short side. My long side on its own, I don't think it's even beat the indexes, but by always having a short strategy that's profitable as well, and that buffers the drawdowns in the long strategy, the overall results are better. Did you ever see that newsletter back in the day called Club 3000? I think so. I vaguely remember. I bring it up in the sense that I'm curious about your testing process. Were you always ongoing, testing everything you could wrap your arms around? Or was it like, hey, once you got what you were interested in and where you wanted to be, you turned off the rest of the world? I mean, how were you? Somewhere in between. I've always been retesting. I mean, if anything, I've tweaked my systems too much. I've fell into a lot of the bad habits. I just started doing it on my own. With I didn't read any books about the proper way to do backtesting or whatever I just did. And I remember the feeling when I first discovered some rules that would have had really good results, feeling like, oh my God, I'm going to be so rich. Not understanding that I probably had overfit the past a little bit. I maintain, even now to some extent, if I'm in an unusual drawdown, I'll go back and retest. I'll probably change the parameters a little to have made that drawdown a little less severe, which is not a good practice. That's where the discretionary side comes in, I guess. Yeah, I didn't really know what I was doing. I've always had some curiosity. If I hear about a new trading idea or something, I'll test it. I also like trying to test if a system is actually described specifically enough in a book or article, which is fairly rare. Descriptions are usually kind of vague. If it's described specifically enough to actually code it, I'll test that, see how it does. They usually don't match the results that are published in the book or article. When I test them, sometimes they do. When did you first start coding? How old were you? I was in ninth grade, whatever age that was. In algebra class, we had to learn basic. This would have been in the mid-70s. So there was a mini computer. It was about the size of a typical refrigerator in a room in, in our high school. 
smaller high schools use time sharing, but we actually had our own box there. And, and there was a room in a room with five or six teletype machines. It's like a keyboard with a roll of paper and a paper tape reader. You basically have to type in your program. And then you can say punch and then it writes it out on a paper tape with little holes in it. And then you can feed in the paper tape to get it back next time. And we had to do little assignments of doing algebra in basic code. But I thought it was fun, so I spent all my after-school time there and started writing more programs and so on. Simultaneously, I was getting very interested in classical music and violin playing, so I put the programming thing on hold for a while, then came back to it in the early 80s when personal computers were introduced and I could have my own computer. Kind of went back and forth, ended up working as a programmer eventually. Fortuitous to then get ahead, let's say... 20 years after you were exposed in high school, 10 years after you became a programmer, then here you are in the mid-90s, all of a sudden realizing, oh, wow, I've got this background that goes back 20 years, and now I can apply. I mean, just like one of those nice tools in the holster, so to speak, where you can just call on it, where you're like, oh, I can use this. Yeah. I know how to write code. Give me some data. I can model stuff. It was definitely fortuitous. Once I saw the opportunity that you could support yourself through trading if you had enough capital. Let me ask you an observation question about where we are today, so to speak. This is not a, an analysis of the markets. I'm talking more about people and particularly traders, investors, and the mindset. Do you think anybody is really any different than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Because it seems like every generation has to come along and get exposed to something, figure something out or not figure something out. Are people any different, really? Does human nature change significantly over time? Probably not. The landscape is different. I feel like in the last 20 years, things have shifted. Mutual fund industry has gone away and the RIA industry that puts people in 60-40 portfolio with some ETFs is the rule now. And most people are taught and believe that that's what they need to do with their retirement money. For most people, it does make sense to just give it to someone else. The psychological pitfalls of trading for yourself for someone who's not committed to it are certainly something to watch out for. More recent years, basically, there's a trend where individual trading has become more and more accessible. When I started, it seemed a little daunting to open a brokerage account and figure out how to place orders. My first trading was done over the phone. And then we graduated to email and then finally got some kind of an online interface. There was more friction. Also, commissions were higher. Now, everybody can trade, quote unquote, for free if you ignore the spread on your phone. That's something you should clarify there because, I mean, a lot of people are going to know exactly what you said, but some people are going to be like, that's going to go right over their head. It's like, oh, hold on, I can trade for free. You got to pay attention to what the spread is. Mr. Griffin down there at Citadel gets to make a little money on you no matter what. Right. That is true. Let me throw it at you about so many people come to me and they want to talk about their intraday trading. How do you feel when people approach you, new investors, new traders, and they want to talk about intraday trading? They want to be at this, I'm going to trade five minutes or one hour bars or whatever. What's your thought when that happens? Because I'm sure it happens to you too. What's your thought when that happens? How do you bring people along? I think most of that is driven by especially people that are brand new. Well, okay, if I can get in and trade this five-minute bar, this one-hour bar, I'm going to get rich faster. Somewhere out there, they pass out a binder that says, for everyone that's brand new, day trade, you're going to get rich faster. That's not true, but that's what happens. What's your thought about the intraday mindset? How do you bring people along to a different perspective? Well, I mean, basically, if someone that wants to trade intraday, they should try trading intraday and see what kind of results they get. In general, in trading and in life, I don't spend a lot of time trying to convince other people of anything. But in terms of intraday, I mean, I'm kind of fighting this battle, if you will, with my own software. And you do share your story, though. So obviously, you do share your wisdom. Yeah, I do. And I also, I mean, I share it most concretely through my software, which has hundreds of users now. And this topic does come up there because as of now, my software only goes down to the daily bar granularity. For most people, my market is not people who want to spend full time in front of the screen, but who want to be able to do a daily process once a day that 
looks like it will have good results for managing their own money. That can be most effectively tested and modeled with daily bars. If you get into fancy execution algorithms or like wanting to stop in, stop out, and stop in again two or three times within one day to establish the right position or whatever, that really requires intraday bars to model correctly. But the farther you go down that path, the more the execution assumption becomes critical. If you're going to go to intraday, systematically, you have to go all the way to tick data and maybe even depth of order book data. It just becomes a massive undertaking, both in terms of cost and in terms of computing. I've taken a stand at daily bars to granularity. Let's find out as much as possible we can do with daily bars. And you can correctly model entering with limit orders, exiting at the close of that day, or even having a target and stop that you place at the same time. And in most cases, you can see which would have been hit first, although not always. As long as your software accounts for those ambiguities and indicates them, you're in good shape. So I have been holding line on daily bars. I remember when I went down the path when I first got TradeStation, and I had been dabbling and wasting money with discretionary ES trading. I thought, well, let's try to build a system. And I found one that looked really great where you just put Keltner channel moving average with some number of ATRs above and below it on a one minute chart. And you buy on the lower band and sell when it gets back to the average or when it gets to the upper band that has spectacular backtest results until you turn on the option and trade station that says require the price trace through your limit price before you fill it. And then you get a downward sloping equity curve. Reality is somewhere in between, but it's hard to know exactly where it is. I just want to point out that as you say that you don't want to tell anybody what to do, your software tells them what they can't do. Yeah. And more importantly, it lets them try things and shows them. What I'm getting at that was on the daily versus the intraday, meaning you just said, hey, I'm not trying to persuade anybody, but you are putting your foot down and saying, hey, I want to help you out here on daily bars. But if you want to go below daily bars, I'm not really your guy. Yeah, as of now, never say never. I may go down an intraday path at some point. It would probably be more to like half hour bars or something. I mean, especially with things that trade 24-7, the concept of a day is a little fuzzier than with stocks, for example. What about weekly? Do you do any weekly bar testing or trading? Personally, I always use daily bars, but a lot of the people using my software are trading some weekly strategies. You know, one guy you've had on a couple of times, Nick Raj, has recently adopted Realtest as his backtesting platform. He has some weekly and even monthly bar strategies that he runs. They're especially effective in the Australian market. You get a tiny bit of distortion when you run a weekly bar test or monthly in particular. The max drawdown can look a little more modest if it happens intra-month. March 2020 is a great example. If you have a monthly bar strategy there, unless your software is calculating drawdown from the high of the bar or the low of the bar, depending on whether you're talking long or short, the max drawdown percent, if you're looking at that in your stats, might be a little less. Even if I'm trading a monthly or testing a monthly strategy, I would typically test it with daily bars and set the entry and exit condition to only happen at the end of the month so that I see the daily stats of the mark to market of the open positions. Let me ask a uh, life question. How is it that you are like you are? Meaning most people wake up and they do the standard life script. Get out of college at 22, get drunk for six years, get married, kids, buy a house, work for the man. How come you did not pull off this exact script? What was it about you at whatever age that you knew you couldn't do that exact script, that you had to do something outside the box? Why you? Yeah, I knew that kind of at the end of high school. I, I can't say why I knew it. I can't point to a, an event that was the catalyst for it. I somehow became aware of that everybody was doing the same thing and that I didn't want to do that. It was very vague. I had this vague goal, like, I want to somehow end run this, find my own way. How old would you have been about, roughly? Oh, 17 or 18. Late 70s, somewhere in there? Yeah, yeah. But I was also living in a world of fantasies and delusions and thinking I was going to be the next great concert violinist, even though I did not have anything like the right chops to legitimately have that belief. So I went and pursued education in music. But like I said, I got back into coding during that time, during the time I was going to music school in New York City. 
when I first I got access to a room full of Apple IIs, and then I got my own computer around 1980. The computer industry was the PC industry and PC software industry were kind of just being born and starting to gel. I thought I would leave music school and go get a computer science degree. I've never really been a fan of formal education. And I thought, I already know how to build software. Why don't I just try to do it myself? And I had this vague idea that I could have a 10-year software career, get wealthy, and then do music full-time the rest of my life. I actually set that goal when I was around 20. And I ended up missing it by three years and not really getting wealthy, but making enough to have a go at leaving the software industry 13 years later. I kind of had that mindset from the beginning, but not with any really specific goal setting or planning around it. It was just kind of a vague intention. Let me keep it at the violin part for a second. You kind of were self-deprecating. I'm sure you're quite good at it. You didn't continue. Maybe you weren't as good as the other people, whatever. You were not afraid to dream, even though you're saying, well, I don't know why I was thinking I could do this. But isn't that part of the magic for anyone that's down an entrepreneurial path? You walk into the dream. If it doesn't work, you adjust. That's what I see if I look at you. A guy who's like, okay, I'm going to do this. Oh, dead end. Adjust. Ooh, I'm going to do this. Okay, change, switch. You don't seem to be somebody who's afraid to keep adjusting on the fly. Oh, that's true. I'm very present-centered. I agree with the premise of what you're saying, that it's easy enough if you had a dream in the past and then you ended up on a different path, it's easy enough to look back and say, oh, that dream was delusional. But I agree, it's important that I had that dream and went down the path. And I think just trying your best to get good at something that's a significant skill, you develop general skills and abilities from that process, whatever the specific skill is, whether it's a sport or performing art or whatever. I agree with that. Just by nature, I've always been more or less present-centered. And I love the question, what's next? Every day, take in the information of what's happening now. What might I do differently? You can be more dynamic about that when you're younger, perhaps. Still like that. Are you saying present-centered in a Buddhist-like way? How are you defining present-centered? No, not specifically. It's just more of a personality type thing where some people like to always have their next few hours, few days, few weeks planned out, make a list and follow the list and so on. And I tend to not do that. For decades, I've not liked to keep a calendar. Of course, you have to have some plans and some commitments and some dates. The fact that we agreed to have this talk at this time. Let me share with you my calendar. I think we might have some similarities here in terms of life approaches. So my calendar is this. I do not use these invites. I don't use any electronic calendars. I don't want to mess with it. It slows me down. I take one piece of paper and I draw the boxes on it. And I put basically, probably put three to four months on a calendar. I only really only do it because I do the podcast. If I didn't do the podcast, I probably wouldn't do it. Then I could put my podcast interviews on there and I could put what days I'm going to exercise on there. That's it. We're similar in that regard. I don't want anything else. And the only thing that goes on that calendar are exercise days and podcast interviews. That is it. I do not want to be attached. I can't tell you how many people tell me, especially people that are telling me I should interview XYZ person or whatever, a publisher or PR firm. And it's like, oh, Michael, uh, send us an invite. I don't do that. I don't even know what that is. I'm not doing it. I don't want to learn. I don't care. Yeah, right. Another trader who I met online a year or two ago. So oh, let's have a chat. And it sent me a link to something where it listed all these hours of the day when he would be available and I had to pick one. And I found that really weird. Did you do it? I refused to do that shit. No, I did it. I think that was his method. You're a nice guy. I try to be nice. This is an interesting thing about information. You're an information guy. And if I put my little calendar of information on one sheet of paper, somebody out there convinced me how something on my phone or my computer that I can absorb three to four months faster than just glancing at that sheet of paper. I cannot. It's impossible. A lot of the automation that we live these days doesn't make us better, efficient, more productive. I think it bogs us down with all kinds of nonsense. Yeah, I totally agree. We order these classic paper calendars where there's one piece of paper per month and it's in like a plastic holder so you can take them out. You write the big things in there, and then there might be another slip of paper that shows what's coming up in the week. 
And it's mostly my wife. I mean, my way of scheduling in general is to send her an email saying, I have to do this at this time. <laughs> Please write it on the calendar. Where are you living right now? I'm in Reading, Massachusetts, which is about 12 miles north of Boston. Gotcha. I've not been to Boston since I was a kid, and I still have to go to Fenway. I've never seen Fenway. It is an amazing park. Very pretty much lived in the Boston area most of my life, except the four years I went to school in New York City and the first three years of my life, which I don't remember, which took place in Maine and Connecticut. Other than that, I've been in the Boston area. Obviously, the owner of the Boston Red Sox made all of his money as a trend-following trader. He's probably made a lot more money on owning a sports team. But I remember back in the day, there was a Futures Industry Association event, and he was speaking. And I want to say it was in early 1995, after he had just won all this Barings Bank money, being on the other side of Nick Leeson. And he gave a speech in lower Manhattan, right there at World Trade Center 1 and 2. And there was like a Marriott there. He gave a speech. It was a really interesting speech. I remember I went outside and then he came out with a couple other guys. And I remember he got into this crazy looking limo and they headed north on Manhattan. There was some guy standing next to me smoking a cigarette and it was his CPA or the in-house accountant or whatever. And so we just got to chatting a little bit about everything they were doing and whatever. And I started asking about some of these questions you and I are talking about. And he's like, oh, come on, man. We just Lotus one, two, three. We just coded all there. This was the guy who was running at that time, $3 billion or whatever, who just made a half billion dollars on that trade and just nonchalant in-house accountant just describing the basic coding strategy of using Lotus. That was one of the most interesting things because people always want to have a vision of something much more monumental going on than perhaps is really going on. But that's life. Oh, for sure. I became fully automated in my trading at the start of 2000. And this was using Excel with a little bit of VBA code, which is the macro language inside Excel. And I kept using Excel and VBA for my automation all the way until like 2017, I think it was. Well, it was partly because IB changed their Excel ActiveX plugin, so it didn't work anymore with my worksheet. And I said, okay, I'll finally write something else. And I wrote something in C Sharp. It's not rocket science. That's like the airplane going across the sky, carrying the advertising banner. It's not rocket science. I think what's rocket science is to have the philosophical understanding, the construct of what this is, does take a certain amount of thinking differently, thinking outside the proverbial box. Well, that's just science science. That's the idea that you have a hypothesis and you test it. If it doesn't work, you throw it out. Yeah, that's cool stuff. We'll have to get coffee here. Wendy, have you been to Asia? I have never been to Asia. At some point, I'll probably find my way over there. A lot of my uh, users of my software are Australian. We'll see. Never been too much of a traveler. It was never my plan. I don't necessarily feel like I like to travel too much these days. It feels like so many places have become tourist traps, so to speak. Any place I can be that's not filled with tourists but that is interesting. I enjoy that. And that's kind of where I am right now. I find there's something magical about Asia. I remember the first time I had the chance to experience it. And you're just like, okay, this is a different ball game. Well, I was eating my breakfast. I was listening to your 1200th, I got it right this time, episode, Larry Height. Not that you've had him 1200 times, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Almost that many. The part where you talk about if you're going to go somewhere, stay there for a few months, that would be my inclination to logistically a little bit complex when you have a family. The, the idea of doing typical tourism has never appealed to me. So many places that everyone hears about are just nightmares when you get there. I mean, a place like Bali, I mean, let's say, hey, Bali, you pray love. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. You could give that a shot. <laughs> kind of like you were saying, hey, if somebody wants to enter a trade, oh yeah, go ahead. You go give it a shot and report back. Hey, I want to go on vacation to Bali. Okay, you give that a shot and report back. <laughs> You know? Right, right. Marston, cool stuff. We'll have to catch up every now and again. I appreciate you coming on. Love to. I've been aware of you for decades. So I'm just very happy to have had a chance to chat. Decades? My gosh. I know. I think. Probably. <laughs> I put a website up in October of 96. Yeah, yeah. It was so interesting because it was like, wow, there wasn't really any business at first, but it was like I could see the traffic. My entire feedback loop was oh, let me share this interesting bit of trading insight. 
oh, I can look at my traffic logs. This is interesting. Everybody around the world is looking at this. It's 1996. And you know that same feeling because you were right there at the same time. I mean, I was doing my own thing under the radar. You were very smart and early to catch the first wave of putting stuff online and attracting customers that way. Nothing is ever planned. You throw something at the wall and you see what sticks. Cool stuff. Marcin, first off, I should say, people should definitely check you out in Jack Schwager's book, Unknown Market Wizards. By the way, the paperback edition is coming out, I think, in September. And he's actually re-interviewed everybody to find out how they did during COVID and to add supplemental material about that. So that'll be interesting to get the paperback version when it comes out also. You bring up something interesting. Beyond performance variations, what did COVID mean to you in terms of trading? The main thing COVID meant to me is that the orchestra that I play in, which takes a fair amount of my time, shut down. All of my awake time basically was free for software development. That's pretty much the year when I overhauled my backtesting software and polished it for commercial release and decided to make a product of it. That's pretty much what COVID meant for me. In terms of lifestyle, it didn't mean anything because I pretty much introverted and working in front of my screen most of the time, anyhow, except for the orchestra change. It's nice to be able to do that again. Where can we send people? Where would you like to direct people? My website is mhptrading.com which has some stuff about me, links to podcasts I've been on. This one will be on there soon. Information about my software, if people are interested in trying that out. Yeah, it can backtest futures stock systems. In fact, I've even got an example script that implements the turtle strategy. Twitter, I don't tweet very often, but it's Mars10, that's M-A-R-S-1-0, P as in Parker. That's my Twitter handle. Sometimes I say on this podcast, and maybe it sounds a little cavalier, but I say, well, if you can't find a particular guest on this podcast for some reason, then you probably weren't meant to find them because it's pretty easy to find you if you type in your name into Mr. Google. Like I, my name is Jack Smith. <laughs> it's pretty easy. <laughs> I posted something the other day on Twitter and I saw a response. It was like just a picture of my books. Someone said, are these on Amazon? I was thinking to myself, is this even a real person? <laughs> Who asked this question? Who asks... If the guy that has just put an image up of his eight books, who asks if they're on Amazon? I mean, I don't know. Somebody who's challenged, I guess. How in the hell are they even on my Twitter asking questions to a trading author if they're challenged? The world's crazy. Well, now we have a new answer for those people, which is go ask ChatGPT, see what they say. Yeah, that's a whole different conversation. It's going to be interesting to see if that ever uh, becomes competition for you in the future. I have a feeling it's a long ways away in terms of that. I mean, it may become useful at helping people shorten the learning curve of software like mine, but that's different from competition. That's just a productivity tool in that case. So far, I've been able to use it for some thesaurus type things. <laughs> I'm waiting for something more advanced. Mars, actually, very nice meeting you. I appreciate you coming on. Again, people can find you out there and they need to check out the new edition of Unknown Market Wizards coming in paperback. Appreciate you coming on. Okay. Thanks, Michael. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.